asking for victory, which we finally got. Uh, we probably won't start reading from this until next week because I've got a lot of pre-material to go through to try and make this uh, an even more clear understanding of the concept of earthly desires equal enlightenment. I was asked by Mr. Uh, Lee uh, some time ago, and I did a whole thing, you know, and I talked about it from the perspective of the thing that launched my, my faith, really, was my experience with the grunion. And so I told that as like a, you know, earthly desire, and then that's led me all this time. But there are deeper understandings to this concept of earthly desire is equals, delight, equals enlightenment. And the first time you hear it, it probably will just be words. Uh, but uh, I'm going to get into uh, a lot of depth here real quick before we read the Gosha. The Gosha is only three pages long. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is go back to something that we've also already read. Mm -hmm. But I need everybody to understand that what President Kate is going to say and what I'm going to say are all predicated on this faith of Buddhism, of Nietzsche and Buddhism. It's the Soka Gakkai's interpretation. Okay, because this has never been exactly what Nietzsche and Shoshu taught from the very beginning. And I won't get into any of that ugliness, but um, it's the truth. And the path to Buddhahood can only be achieved by understanding the correct teaching. Okay? So if you're not practicing the correct teaching correctly, then you pretty much probably don't understand what it really is. What it really is. You, you feel like you understand it. You see a result from how you embrace it. But the growth of your life is going to take you to a point where that isn't going to sustain, sustain anymore. And the benefits aren't going to come so easy anymore. And you've got to look inside your life for the sake of, yeah, yeah, I know. We've got, we've got beg, beggars at the door. This time it's not a barking all this time. They're going to be beating the glass behind everybody. Don't give them a treat because they'll never stop. Just wave to them. All right, so... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read from this, and um, I'm going to skip some of what I was going to say to get to it. All right, so this is the bottom of page 22 of the Commentaries on Buddhahood by the Soka Gakkai Study Department. Mr. Uh, Saito is the one that uh, is uh, the author uh, of this, actually, to some degree. And so uh, I start at the bottom of page 22 going into the important thing that you need to understand. All right, here we go. Uh, this is the difference between what we see and think and what the actual priesthood of Nietzsche and Shoshu is teaching the people that practice this Buddhism of chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. That's the, you know, based on this, the Nikko schools teaching, the, you know, they still got the orally transmitted teaching, still got the basic same concept of everything except one. And that's the separation between the priesthood and everybody else, okay? And feudalistically, what occurred with Nietzsche and Shoshu is what would normally occur with any organization like that. It becomes something that's compounded by an ability to, how, how do they support themselves? Do they all have regular jobs and they come, no. then they do the, no, no, no. How do they get supported? Because they're supported by the people. So in order to be supported, they have to elevate themselves to a point of worthiness for that, because otherwise you have to understand that Daishon is teaching to the point that that's automatic amongst everyone, all right? So let me just get into this little thing talking about why we have two different perspectives of the same thing. Okay, uh, because of the high, this is the bottom of page 22 from this, from this lecture, a pamphlet, says, because of the high priest actions in this regard, we say that Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood, pardon me, I'll go up a paragraph. Uh, Members of the Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood concerned only with priestly pre, uh, privilege reacted neg negatively to the SGI's view of faith, which is that, you know, none of us are separate and not all of us are equal. Uh, while some priests recognized the correctness of the SGI, the majority tended to abuse their uh, I'm going to go up. I'm so sorry. I'm going to start at the page of top of page 22 of this. All right. Mm. Nichiren clarifies that to chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo with this perspective is not the correct practice. That's where it was. I was supposed to start from. Here we go. Okay. All right. Any religion that seeks salvation in the abstract or the absolute tends to focus on things far removed from ordinary 
people. Furthermore, such religions give rise to intermediaries, intermediaries between the absolute God, the Buddha, and ordinary people. By virtue of being closer to the Buddha or God, the clergy is viewed as superior mm. to ordinary people. Mm -hmm. That sort of discriminato discriminatory view, which is the essence of the Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood, is also a way of thinking that the law is outside of yourself. Do you understand? Mm. Because the truth is that the na nam myoho rengeku is actually your life itself. That's the whole freaking point of this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. Is that when you really break it down, it's the original state. The original state of existence is nam myoho rengeku. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that exists in the entire universe that doesn't have as its basic building block the, uh, the principle of the, uh, of the non-duality of cause and effect. Okay, it's particle physics. It's just like modern science has proven this thing. It's not necessarily cause and effect. Cause and effect can occur mm -hmm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, in particle physics, something doesn't actually take the, uh, uh, the, the nature of what it is until it, it identifies an appearance. Mm -hmm. It's a fuzzy, it's a fuzzy bunch of, and, and then once it's identified, then it, then it becomes focused. Okay, so which it means that there's causality going on from moment to moment that is in a state of flux. Yes. It's, you know, everything isn't moment by moment set in advance. Each moment is mutable. It, you know, you can, you can change it. Hmm. It's not immutable. All right, so Nietzsche clarifies after I just said this is also a way of thinking that the law is outside yourself. And the most important thing is to realize the law is not outside yourself. You and Nietzsche and Daishonin are both human beings. Mm -hmm. The Buddhahood that you're aspiring to attain is the same Buddhahood, the same Buddhahood that he achieved in his life. Okay? That's why we emulate his actions and his thoughts, his behavior, his perspective. Okay? So as Nietzsche clarifies that to chant Nam Yoho Rengeko with this perspective that the law is outside of yourself is not the correct practice to enable one to attain Buddhahood in this lifetime. So this, if you look at the Gohonzon without realizing that the Gohonzon is actually a conveyance of you in a form that you can see your highest state maintain a relationship with it. I mean, when you're thinking while you're chanting to the Gohonzon, who are, who's hearing those thoughts? Some spooky... No. no, it's your own Buddha nature listening to your Buddha nature enlighten you to the Buddha nature that exists inside you. Mm. The only teacher that can teach you anything is yourself because you have to have the faith to accept what you what you what you able to perceive. All right. OK, this letter written in early uh, in Nietzsche's uh, uh, undertaking of his mission, widespread hum, uh, happy, human happiness, is already a refutation of the Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood. Since the inception of the Soka Gakkai under the first president, Tanesaburo Makaguchi, members have regarded Buddhism as a teaching about their own lives, about their attainment of Buddhahood, and about establishing peace in their world. Based on this Buddhist viewpoint, SGI members have developed their faith, chanting nam myoho Rengeko, which is why Kosen Rufu has made such progress. It's because the individuals as human beings have made progress. Mm -hmm. yes. That's why it's made progress. It's not built on the building blocks of some smart guy that we all follow. Mm -hmm. It's based on us doing exactly what the smart guy is saying. If what I'm saying is true, you do it to see what happens. Okay? Mm -hmm. Members of the Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood concerned only with priestly privilege reacting negatively to the SGI's view of faith. That it's about us. We're the men, you know, we're the ones that support you guys. While some priests recognize the correctness of the SGI, men, the majority tended to abuse their religious authority. Japan's feudal age, during Japan's feudal age, there was a government-sponsored parish system that organized, that pardon me, encouraged Buddhist priests to exert great authority over ordinary people. This system promoted for the lay believers a subservient relationship to the priests. The temples were how the government kept track of everybody, okay? The Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood strongly asserted such priestly authority today. Pardon me. Uh, strongly asserts such priestly authority today. Again, their doctrine today is if we deviate from the way they look at things, we couldn't, attain poss we couldn't possibly attain Buddhahood. Which, like, duh, I got, I got news for you. I did. 
okay? And it didn't have a damn thing to do with you, Mr. Nietzsche and Shoshu Priesthood, okay? And I say Mr. for a reason, all right? Uh, the Nietzsche and Shoshu Priesthood strongly asserts such priestly authority today. Nikan Abe, the previous high priest, attempted to destroy the religion dedicated to Kosenrufu, built by the Soka Gakkai, in favor of reviving a priest-centered doctrine. Mm -hmm. Because of the high priest's actions in this regard, we say that Nietzsche and Shoshu Priesthood committed slander of the law. The priesthood is strayed fundamentally from Nietzsche and Buddhism. As Nietzsche says, if you think the law is outside yourself, you are embracing not the mystic law, but an inferior teaching. Here, an inferior teaching refers to teachings that are incomplete or disingenuous. We can consider this passage as Nietzsche's refutation of the Nietzsche and Shoshu priesthood. In general, religion tends to center on the clergy, but Nietzsche was opposed to this. Uh, based, based on the Lotus Sutra's essential ideal that all people can attain Buddhahood, Nietzsche transcended religion's clergy-centered tendency and its potential for th authoritarianism. From the beginning, this Buddhism has been a teaching of reform. He established his central teaching of chanting Nam Yaho Rengekyo as the way for all people to attain Buddhism, uh, to attain Buddhahood. Okay, so to attain Buddhahood. What is to attain Buddhahood then? All right? What is to attain Buddhahood? The understanding of all the Buddha is Huh? The understanding of the Buddha is Exactly. To... Chant Daimoku and to perceive that the Gohonzon is your life, that it exists within you, that it's not what you're looking at that's been given to you by the priesthood, but that in reality that is an immutable uh, uh, reflection of your original state, okay? Because that's what the Daishona did. He put down an immutable reflection of his original state. We all share that same reflection. We're all human beings, okay? So... Then, how do we attain, how, what is this process of attaining Buddhahood in our present form? Chanting, obviously, but we have to grow while we chant, okay? Because we have to, we have to teach others, right? right? right. So we can't just chant. Right. Yeah. We have to chant with a process of yeah. growth occurring. That's why many of the difficulties that we experience actually occur. There are benefits. Mm -hmm. I would not be who I am at this moment mm -hmm. with all the, out, all the things that forced me to modify my behavior. And I mean forced me to modify my behavior. I had to look deeply in myself to figure out how could I be so off. But I was. And I thought I was fairly well understanding what the deal was. Yeah. Okay, so the key for me always comes back to these six stages of practice because I they're so visible in my life anyhow, and I think that they are in everybody's. But this ultimately always culminates in Buddhahood, this explanation. It's on page 124 of the record of the orally transmitted teachings. It's point one from the uh, chapter 16, the lifespan of the thus come one, nam myoho Gekyo. He says uh, on page 124, just a couple paragraphs down. Pardon me, I'll, I'll start at the top again. Now it is the understanding of Nietzsche and his followers. Mm -hmm. All right, because it's our understanding because this is what he's taught us. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, that generally speaking, the term thus come one, which would normally mean Buddha or something, you know, separated from those of us in the nine worlds, refers to all living beings. And I've clarified to you, all living beings are sentient or non-sentient. So the plants are living beings as far as everything I'm going to talk about from now here on out. Mm -hmm. And by virtue of the fact that neither living beings nor in, you know, sentient nor insentient living beings can exist without an environment, the environment's included in that. We never, ever occur just floating in air or some shit. And we never occur by ourselves. There's always more than one of us. This being the case... Okay, now it is the understanding of Nietzsche and his followers that generally speaking, the term thus come one refers to all living beings. More specifically, it refers to the disciples and lay supporters of Nietzsche. Now he doesn't say uh, disciples and lay supporters of Shakyamuni. Mm. He's, because we're talking about the difference between the, the Buddhism of harvest and the Buddhism of sowing. Mm. What we're doing now is something that's different than what Shakyamuni actually expounded because it was not time yet mm. for that clarity to be made available. The Bodhisattvas of the earth weren't around to carry it forward. They don't come until this chapter. 
And then they split again a few chapters later to appear when? Later in the, in the latter day of the law, right? Okay, so the title of honor for one who is eternally endowed with the three bodies is nam yoho rengekyo. That's why I said that thus come one nam yoho rengekyo. That's what I am. As far as I'm concerned, that's what all you are. But your actions actually determine that, not my opinion. This is what the three concerns of, uh, great concerns of actuality of the lifespan chapter uh, refer to. And he's talking about the three great secret laws there. Now, this is the whole thing, the six stages of practice. Speaking in terms of the stages of practice, the thus come one in this chapter, in this chapter, chapter 16, the lifespan of the thus come one, nam yoho rengekyo, this Buddha, like us, we're, we're that kind of Buddha. We're not 16 feet tall, yeah. okay? We're common mortals that dwell with the 10th world available to us, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Speaking in terms of the six stages of practice, the thus come one in this chapter is an ordinary mortal who is in the first stage, that of being a Buddha in theory. We talk about this all the time. If you've never heard of nam myoho renge -kyo, you theoretically have the Buddha nature, but you've never brought it forth, so it's still theoretical in its construct as a part of your reality, okay? He says uh, that is uh, that of being a Buddha in theory. When one reverently accepts nam myoho renge -kyo, this is the next stage, that of hearing the name and the words of the truth, that is, one has for the first time heard the Daimoku. So the name and the words of the truth isn't the Lotus Sutra. In the latter day of the law, it's Nam Yoho Rengekyo. That is, one for the first time heard the Daimoku. Having heard the Daimoku, one proceeds to put it into practice. This is the third stage, that of perception and action. In this stage, one perceives the object of devotion that embodies the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Okay, Ichin and Sanzen. So in this, in this, okay. When having heard the Daimoku, one proceeds to put it in practice. This is the third stage, that of perception and action. In this stage, one perceives the object of devotion that embodies the three realms in a single moment of life. You perceive it. When one succeeds in overcoming various obstacles of illusions, like the fact that it's that piece of paper hanging there, it's not your life itself. Okay, don't forget, you, you know, he's, he's, he, t he says in, um, to Abutsubo, you know, your life itself is Myoho Rengekyo, okay? That's what he's talking about. When you get, overcome those things, like, again, he has to tell Abutsubo because Abutsubo hasn't come to that realization. Mm -hmm. He's still tithing to Nietzsche as though he's a special, different person. And Nietzsche is going out of his way to say, no, 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 no. This is the Buddhism for human beings. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> when one succeeds in overcoming various ob obstacles and illusions, this is the fourth stage, that of resemblance to enlightenment, because you've gone through everything that would be inclusive of having, uh, having achieved Anatara Samyak Sambodai. When one sets out to convert others, this is the fifth stage, that of progressive awakening, because you can't do that unless you do shakabuku. You can't progressively awaken to the truth of this Buddhism unless you practice this Buddhism com uh, correctly, and unless you're sharing it with other people, you're not practicing it correctly, okay? Uh, when one comes at last to the realization that one is a Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies, then one is a Buddha of the sixth and highest stage to that of ultimate enlightenment. Speaking of the chapter as a whole, the idea of gradually over overcoming illusions is not the meaning of the lifespan chapter. You should understand that the ultimate meaning of this chapter is that ordinary mortals, just as they are in their original states of being, are Buddhas, okay? Now that's from the OTT. I gave you Mr. Saito. Now I'm going to go uh, through a bunch of dictionary definitions that will uh, help us. Oh, my God. Okay, here it is. Thank God. I thought I lost it. All right. Since this is the, the Gosha we're going to read is earthly desires are enlightenment, right? Right. Mm. Okay. What are earthly desires? Like ease, peace, uh, yeah, yeah, all the all the fundamental shit, like you know, like I need oxygen. That's an earthly desire, okay? 
All right, so let's go through the earthly desires and let's go through earthly desires or enlightenment to understand what the difference between the two concepts are, okay? Mm -hmm. Earthly desires from page 139 of the uh, uh, Dictionary uh, uh, Buddhism. It says, earthly desires, also illusions, defilements, impurities, earthly passions, or simply desires. So did that include everything? Illusions are earthly desires. I'm going to marry Cary Grant or, you know, I'm going to marry wh whoever you guys dream of marrying. OK, uh, defilements. OK, these are these are things that that negate your humanity. All right. You defile who you really are. You, you bring yourself down through its impurities, earthly passions or simple desires, simply desires, a generic term for all of the workings of life that cause one psychological and physical suffering and impede the quest for enlightenment, including desires and illusions in the general sense. Earthly desires are also re referred to as fetters or bonds because they bind people to the realm of delusion and suffering. Mm. Buddhism regards them as the fundamental cause for affliction and suffering and presents various analysis and perspectives on them. Now that's Buddhism of the Harvest, all right? The Treatise for Great Perfection of Wisdom by Nagar Junya, Juna says that the three poisons of greed, anger, and foolishness are the most fundamental earthly desires and gives rise to all others. The Treatise on the Establishment of Consciousness Only, consciousness only uh, Doctrine uh, compiled by Dharma Pela uh, divides earthly desires into two types, fundamental and deriv derivative. The ten fundamental earthly desires consist of five delusive inclinations of greed, anger, foolishness, arrogance, and doubt, and the five false views. Moreover, there are 20 derivative earthly desires that arise from and accompany these fundamental ones. For example, irritability, the tendency to bear grudges, and the desire to inflict harm derived from uh, anger. Tantai classified earthly desires and set forth the three categories of illusions, illusions of thought and desire, illusions of the innumerable, uh, illusions innumerable as the dust particles of, uh, and, uh, particles of dust and sand, and illusions about the true nature of existence. See also the five false views, which I'll touch on in a moment. Earthly desires are enlightenment now. So now we talk about it from the perspective of uh, Nietzsche's teaching, because this is a Mahayana principle. OK, earthly desires are in light because in Hinayana, earthly desires is like get rid of them. Right. Once to be blown out. Nirvana means blown out. It means you got rid of the earthly desires so you can cease to exist. So you're no longer bound to, a, 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 you know, an existence that it has suffering in it. OK, that's the way you just disappear forever. Earthly desires are enlightenment from page 139 still. A uh, bono soko bodai, I mean, a bono soku bodai, we know that from our old Japanese days. A Mahayana principle based on the view that earthly desires cannot exist independently on their own. Therefore, one can attain enlightenment without eliminating earthly desires. Mm. This contrasts with the Hinayana view that uh, extinguishing earthly desires is a prerequisite for enlightenment. According to the Hinayana teachings, earthly desires and enlightenment are two independent and opposing forces, and the two cannot coexist. While the Mahayana teaching reveals that earthly desires are one and inseparable from enlightenment. This is because all things, even earthly desires and enlightenment, are manifestations of the unchanging reality or truth, which is a reference to the truth of Nam Myoho Rengekyo, the original state and thus are non-dual at their source, because everything is non-dual at its source. Do you understand? That's so cool. Everything is non-dual. So what does that mean? Everything is connected. There's no separation between anything. We are, everything shares the same original state. That's why each moment is an immutable event. It's not, or pardon me, is a mutable event, not an immutable event. It's just the opposite. It's a mutable event. It doesn't come into final focus until it happens. Okay? That's why we never give up to the last moment, because by extending it, even a moment beyond where we might have otherwise quit is the difference between victory and, and failure. Okay? So he says... <clears throat> 
This contrast with the Hinayana view that extinguishing earthly desires is a prerequisite for enlightenment. According to the Hinayana teachings, earthly desires and enlightenment are two independent opposing factors and the two cannot coexist, while the Mahayana teaching reveal, teachings reveal that earthly desires are one and inseparable from enlightenment. This is because all things, even earthly desires and enlightenment, are manifestations of the unchanging reality or truth. That's always nam myoho rengekyo whenever you hear that phrase. The unchanging reality or truth is always the original state, okay? Which is nam myoho rengekyo, and thus are nam dual at their source. The Universal Worthy Sutra, an epilogue to the Lotus Sutra, states without either cutting off earthly desires or separating themselves, uh, pardon me, separating themselves from the five desires, they can purify all their senses and wipe away all of their offenses. So they're not in conflict with the original Hinayana teachings at all. This is just, this is the right way to do it, okay? And the only way to do it in the latter day. Tantai says, in great concentration and insight, the ignorance and dust of desires are enlightenment, and the sufferings of birth and death are nirvana. In the record of orally transmitted teachings, Nietzsche uh, states the idea of gradually overcoming delusions is not the ultimate le uh, meaning of the lifespan chapter of Lotus Sutra. You should understand that the ultimate meaning of this chapter is that ordinary people, just as they are in their original state of being, are Buddhas. And today, when Nietzsche and his followers recite the words nam myoho rengekyo they are burning the firewood of earthly desires, summoning up the wisdom fire of enlightenment, and summoning up, uh, summoning up the, the wisdom fire of enlightenment. Because earthly desires are, are enlightenment and the sufferings of birth and death. What's the significance of that as it relates to um, us as living entities? This is so cool. It's so simple. And it's the truth. This is the bottom line. You have to understand this point. I just said, I read you earthly desires for a reason. Because it's the cause of all kinds of bad shit, and you know it does. Okay? But what, what, he's, what he's really qualifying here is that um, with earthly desires mean you're alive. You're in a manifest state, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about, the temporary gathering of the five components. Okay? Because the truth is, is that there's no Buddhahood outside of the Sahe world. There's no true Buddhahood outside of the Sahe world. There's no true, there's no Buddha land other than the Sahe world. We are already all Buddhas. We don't need to go someplace to hang out with a bunch of Buddhas. We're already doing that if we understand the truth. Okay, if we don't, we see everything separated. We see all of the shit that hits us coming from different things, not coming from us, okay? Okay, so the five components. Now everybody knows what the five components are, right? What are the five components? These five components are, are everything. Everything has the five components, is made up of the five components. What's the first one? What's the most important one? What's the one you can't do anything without? You're not even really here without it. Form. Form. Yeah, your body, your whole body is, is a sense organ. You know, your skin, everything. My eyes can see, my nose can smell, my mouth can taste, my ears can hear. But I, I'm, my whole body is a, is, is a sensory perception vehicle for me. Okay, but that's just my body. What is actually getting all those signals? My mind, okay, which is indestructible, which is eternal, which is, if I make it so, one with nam myoho rengekyo, because that is the original state of all minds. Are you with me? Okay, so let's go into the five components. Why is that important? Because ah, that's what we are. We're temporary, but that's the real, that's the important thing to remember is that we're the temporary gathering of the five components, okay? That means that if you think that there's going to be another of, one of me, there will never be another one of me, okay? Because I will not reincarnate, I will transmigrate, okay? My form will change based on the causes that I have in my karma that I've accumulated and added to 
in this lifetime, okay? Who, the merits that I receive in my, from my mind, my capacity, okay, is going to be different. It's going to change. It will have expanded more because I've devoted my life to the law. I never go back or stay the same. I'm the Buddha. I'm always progressing. Okay, so five components of life, five aggregates, five skandhas. The five components are form. Because you have form, you can perceive. You have perception. Because you have perception, you have conception. Because you can perceive, you can conceive, right? The next one is volition, because I can think about all this stuff and now discern it and, and kind of separate it out. I can go do, I can take action, okay? So the, the fourth one is uh, uh, volition and then uh, 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 consciousness. I'm sorry if I blew that. Form, perception, conception, volition, and consciousness. They all are building blocks to consciousness. Mm. Form is an initial space, then Perception, conception, and volition, that fills up what's in your mind, right. all right? Buddhism holds that these constituent elements unite temporarily to form an individual living being. They unite temporarily to form an individual human being. Together, they also constitute one of the three realms of existence, the other being the realm of living beings and the realm of the environment. Form means the physical aspect of life and includes the five sense organs, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, with which one perceives the external world. Perception is the function of receiving external information through the six sense organs, the five sense, sense organs plus the mind, which integrates the impressions of the five sentences. Conception is the function of creating mental images and concepts out of what has been perceived. Everybody's with me? Mm -hmm. Volition is the will that acts on the conception and motivates action. Consciousness is the cognitive function of discernment that integrates the components, integrates perception, conception, and volition. Mm. Form represents the physical aspect of life, while perception, conception, volition, and, and consciousness represent the spiritual aspect. Because the physical and spiritual aspects of life are inseparable. There can be no form without consciousness and no consciousness without form. So we never get to be spooky, weird dudes floating around like spirits and shit, okay? That is not how we manifest. We don't manifest as ghosts, okay? I'll say it again. Because the physical and spiritual aspects of life are inseparable. Without the body, you can't have right. the mind. Without the mind, the body doesn't work. Okay? Because the physical and spiritual aspects are inseparable, there can be no form without consciousness and no consciousness without form. So if you perceive future lifetimes where it's like you've made up some weird shit is what you've done. Okay? <clears throat> All life carries on its activities through the interaction of these five components. Their workings are colored, are colored by the karma one formed in previous lifetimes and at the same time create new karma, okay? Because they transform through causality, okay? You're, you're reflecting an effect and then you change the, you know, you gain wisdom. You use that consciousness for the sake of advancement. That's why you never stay in the same place as a Buddha. All right? Uh, the five delusive inclinations are not going to get five false views. I do this only because this will put a, a, a damper on your ego. Five false views. Uh, this is from the consciousness only doctrine, but again, it was uh, involved when we were talked about uh, uh, one of the last things we just talked about, the earthly desires. All right. The five, uh, five de uh, delusive inclinations constitute the ten fundamental earthly desires. Tantai included these ten in the illusions of thought and desire for the first three categories of illusion. The five false views are, though the mind and body are no more than a temporary union of the five components, one regards them as possessing a self that is absolute. Do you understand what he just said there? What it just said there? All right. One, though the mind and body are no more than a temporary union, I already, I already read you the definition. It says it's a temporary, right? Mm -hmm. so, so even if, since you know, even though you might read that concept philosophically, 
you still believe that Tom's going to hang on into the next lifetime. Tom ends with death in this lifetime. The eternal Tom, the nam yaho ringekyo thus come one Tom, is the one that proceeds. Okay? And he takes on the appearance, nature, and aspect that's necessary for him to do the job the next time. Okay? It won't be the same crew, maybe. Or it will be they're advancing. And so you're helping them advance. Think of your mom and your dad or those people that don't practice, that you love. You're going to shakabuku them. Yes. Don't worry about it. It's just a matter of the right place and the right time and their fortune to affect that great goodness in their lives because you got nothing to do with that. That's them. They got to do that. But how they reflect to you reflects them. So if you're the Buddha... They must have a connection because they know a Buddha. And that is a very, very rare yes. thing. Yes. Okay? So you never have to worry about the people that you care about. Because there's a reason why you care about them that precedes this lifetime. Or you would have never known them in this lifetime. You with me? Yes. All right. Though the mind are no more than a temporary union of five components, one regards them as possessing a self that is absolute. And though nothing in the universe can belong to an individual, one views one's mind as one's own bot, mind and body as one's own possession. All right? You got nothing to say about it. You're a function of reality. Okay? The, de the belief, because this is the way it is. This is the way all life manifests. I don't think any life gets to pre preconceive what it's going to do. It's karma reveals that so your actions you do control what your future is but you do it by how you behave in this moment yes. this life moment is the only thing that exists in the entire universe and the entire universe shares it the entire universe shares this life moment and it's gone it will never be repeated anywhere in the universe all right two the belief in one of two extremes concerning existence that life ends with death or that life persists after death in some eternal and unchanging form, like heaven. Okay, so that's the second de de delusion. Three, denial of the law of cause and effect. Four, adhering to misconceptions and viewing them as the truth, while regarding inferior views as superior. And five, re uh, viewing erroneous practices or precepts as the correct way to enlightenment. It says, see also earthly desires. <laughs> We've already done that. Okay, so then we go past the five false views because I already read it. Now we're going to go to the fusion of reality and wisdom. What is that? And that's on page, um, fusion of reality and wisdom, page 240. What's the fusion of reality and wisdom? I know that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Okay, what is the fusion? Come on, it's coaching yoga. What's fusion of the reality and, huh? Yes! Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes! Okay. Okay. You got a lot of good answers, girl. All right, fusion, reality, and, and, and wisdom. And why is that? Why is that the whole point? When's the only time you actually exist? When you're alive. Reality. Okay. What's the ultimate thing you should be striving for during that reality? The wisdom to perceive what it actually is. Okay? So when these two come together in a, in a lifetime, there's nothing more for you to learn. Okay? There's things, plenty of for you to reflect on. There's plenty of things for you to, re, to, to, to improve upon. But the reality of how you view yourself is Buddhahood. Do you understand that? Yeah. That's what I just read to you from the six stages of practice, isn't it? It was a reality of how you perceived your own life. When you perceived your own life in the object of devotion or that the object of devotion is actually your own life. That's what I'm talking about. Okay? Okay, so this isn't uh, vanilla Nietzsche and Buddhism I'm talking about here. This is the hardcore concept stuff that really is difficult to sustain over the course of a whole lifetime. Mm, yes. uh, and it's a challenge, and that's why you need to be aware of what it is so you can be up to the challenge. All right? The fusion of reality and wisdom. The fusion of the objective reality or truth and the subjective wisdom to realize that truth. 
You follow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which the is which is the Buddha nature inherent in one's life because only the Buddha nature can perceive that truth. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. That truth is the Buddha nature. Since enlightenment or Buddhahood is defined as the state in which one fully realizes the ultimate reality, mm -hmm. fully realizes the ultimate. So in other words, you've been making steps towards this understanding before it suddenly dawns on you after reading a hundred times in the Gosho that, uh, you know, you're a Buddha. And you finally go, shit, <laughs> I am a Buddha. Yes. How else could all this shit be? Oh, my God. <laughs> and then it, everything changes from that point on. Yes. You can never go back and you can never take a day off. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because you yes. have the wisdom to perceive that's not really what you should be doing with your time. Right. Okay? The ultimate enjoyment is Kosen Rufa. Yeah. The ultimate enjoyment is being the Buddha in the Psahe world. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Since enlightenment or Buddhahood is defined as the state in which one fully realizes the ultimate truth, the fusion of reality and wisdom means enlightenment. Tantai discusses the principle in the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra and the annotations on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra. Myolo associates Shakyamuni Buddha and many treasures Buddha as they are portrayed in the Treasure Tower chapter of the Lotus Sutra with the fusion of reality and wisdom. This chapter describes Shakyamuni Buddha seated side by side with many treasures Buddha in the Treasure Tower. Myolo writes that these two Buddhas seated in this manner signify the fusion of reality and wisdom. However, Nichiren says, Nichiren identifies the law that underlies the fusion of reality and wisdom as Namya Horengeko and asserts that he embodied his enlightenment to that law, the fusion of reality and wisdom in the form of the Gohonzon, the object of devotion he established. So all of this really does come back to the truth that you can't get there just by chanting Namya Horengeko. Do you understand that? That's all you have to do once you have the correct object of devotion, but you then also have to perceive the object of devotion for what it is, which is not something outside of yourself. Are you with me? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> in terms of the Buddhist practice for people in the latter day of the law, Nichiren maintained that when they chant Nam Yoho Rengekyo, with deep faith in the Gohonzon, which is the same as deep faith in Nichiren and his teachings, because you're doing, you've, uh, you've, you've assumed the object of devotion for your life to be the one that he's told you this is the right object of devotion. Okay? You're obviously a disciple if you chant Nam Yoho Rengekyo to the Gohonzon. Nichiren maintained that when they chant Nam Myoho Rengeka with deep faith in the Gohonzon, they achieve the fusion of reality and wisdom within their own lives and are thus able to manifest the Buddha nature and attain Buddhahood. According to Nichiren, the Buddha nature consists reality and uh, co constitutes reality. And pardon me, according to Nichiren, the Buddha nature constitutes reality. And faith in the Gohonzon, the embodiment of that nature, corresponds to wisdom. I'll say it again. According to Nichiren, the Buddha nature constitutes reality because what is outside? What is our law? What is uh, 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 the truth of everything that I just talked about? Then it all has and shares in common as the original state, nam yoho Rengekyo. Everything. Everyone. Okay. According to Nichiren, the Buddha nature constitutes reality and faith in the Gohonzon, faith in his teaching, faith in his object of devotion, mm -hmm. the embodiment of that era, uh, uh, nature corresponds to wisdom. Nichiren states, reality means the true nature of all phenomena, the true nature of all pheno phenomena, not the deluded nature of all phenomena. And, the wis and wisdom means illuminating and manifesting this true nature, okay? which is the original state. Uh, thus, when the riverbed of reality is infinitely broad and deep, the water of wisdom will flow ceaselessly. When this reality of wisdom and, uh, 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 with this reality and wisdom are fused, one attains Buddhahood in one's present form. What then are these two elements of reality and wisdom? They are simply the five characters of Namyoho Rengekyo. 
Kyochi Miyogo. You have no idea how many years I chanted to achieve Kyochi Miyogo every time I got in front of a Gohanza because I thought it was going to be some sort of like, and it was, but <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it's 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 more. It's not as profound as you as you may assume. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really finally having everything kick in so that it all makes sense. Why can I read the Go Show? the way I read it from the perception, perspective that I read it. It's because of that one moment. Well, I'm not afraid to say I'm the Buddha too. I'm not afraid to read it all as me being the Buddha. I'm understanding that the Daishona's teaching is to make me understand I am the Buddha, period. Yes. Okay? All right, I go on to then the Gohonzon because he just, you now the, the whole thing boils back to the Gohonzon in reality. You can't do a Kyochi Myogo in the latter day of the law without the Gohonzon. That's what I needed you to understand. Yeah. So the Gohonzon is 525. Uh, two, 252. Two, five, two. I hate the way these are. Okay. 252. Here we go. Um, no, it isn't. Where? I got the wrong page. 252. Yeah, it is. Okay. The object of the devotion. The word go, gohonzon, the object of devotion. The, uh, the word go is an honorific prefix, and honzon means object of fundamental respect or devotion. In Nichiren's teaching, the object of devotion has two aspects. The object of devotion in terms of the law and object of devotion in terms of the person. These may be described as follows. The object of devotion in terms of the law. Nichiren's mandala that embodies the eternal an intrinsic law of Namyo Horengeko, which he revealed. Mm. That law is the source of all Buddhas and the seed of Buddhahood for all people. In other words, Nichiren identified Namyo Horengeko as the ultimate law permeating life and the universe and embodied it in the form of a mandala. In his questions and answers on the object of devotion, Nichiren refers to the object of devotion for people in the latter day of the law as the title Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. He further describes the title as the essence of the Lotus Sutra or Namyo Horengeko to be found only in the depths of the lifespan chapter of the Sutra. Obviously the the, the Chinese title is Myoho Rengeko, right? Mm -hmm. Namyo Horengeko is the fundamental source of Myoho Rengeko. Mm -hmm. You should understand that. Mm -hmm. It's not the other way around. Namyo Horengeko doesn't come from Tiantai. Okay, it doesn't come from the Makashi Khan. Mm. It doesn't come from even Shakyamuni. No, it comes from the original teacher, and his original disciples are the ones that he uh, 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 be entrusted to for the sake of this widespread propagation, which he says is the is the future of mankind. Mm. Okay, so. <clears throat> The object of devotion for the people of the latter day of the law, the title Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra. He further describes the title as the essence of the Lotus Sutra or Namya Horengeko to be found only in the depths of the lifespan 16th chapter of the Sutra. The object of devotion for observing the mind reads, Myoho Rengeko appears in the center of the treasure tower with the Buddha Shakyamuni and many treasures seated to the right and left. Think about the Gohonzon when I'm saying this. And flanking them, the four Bodhisattvas, followers of Shakyamuni, led by superior practices, Majushri, Manjushri, uh, Maitreya, and the, other, and, and, and the other Bodhisattvas, who are followers of the four, four Bodhisattvas, are seated below. In this passage, Nichiren clarifies the relationship between the law of Namya Horengeko, the Buddhist Shakyamuni and many treasures, and the various Bodhisattvas depicted on the Gohonzon. In this way, he emphasizes Namya Horengeko as the fundamental object of devotion. The real aspect of the Gohonzon explains that all living beings of the ten worlds, and living beings of the ten worlds includes all the plants, display the dignified attributes that they inherently possess through the benefit of Namya Horengeko. Nichiren viewed the Daigo Huns and the object of devotion he inscribed for all humanity on the 12th day of the 10th month in 1279 as the purpose of his life. This can be gleaned from his statement in On Persecutions uh, Befalling the Sage, written in the 10th month of 1279. The Buddha fulfill, fulfilled the purpose of his advent in a little over 40 years. The great teacher Tentai took about 30 years and the great teacher Dingyo some 20 years. I have spoken repeatedly of the indestructible, indestructible persecutions they suffered during those years. For me, it took uh, 27 years and, great and the great persecutions I faced are well known to you all. 
The object of devotion in terms of the law, that's the end of his quotation. The object of devotion in terms of the law is explained in greater detail in Nietzsche's writings, such as the object of devotion for observing the mind and the real aspect of the Gohonzon. The second aspect of the Gohonzon is the object of devotion in terms of the person. In his reply to Kyoho, Nietzsche writes, I, Nietzsche, have inscribed my life in Sumi Inc., so believe in the Gohonzon with your whole heart. The Buddha's will is the Lotus Sutra, but the soul of Nietzsche is nothing other than Nam Yoho Rengekyo. Nietzsche here expresses his realization that Nam Yoho Rengekyo is the origin and a basis of his life, which he embodied in Sumi Inc. in the form of the mandala he calls the Gohonzon. In the record of the orally transmitted teaching, he says the object of devotion is thus the entirety of the entire body of the votary of the Lotus Sutra. The votary here refers to Nietzsche himself. He also says the Buddha of the latter day of the law is an ordinary person and an ordinary priest. An ordinary priest here refers to Nietzsche. Because Nietzsche revealed and spread Nam Yoho Rengekyo, which is man manifest as the person in the law, he is regarded by his disciple and designated successor, Nikko, in IKKO, and that's why Nietzsche and Shoshu and us are the only ones really that think this way, or the derivative uh, schools that were formed by priesthood, the two priesthood sects that, that split off from Nietzsche and Shoshu. Uh, you know, if you go to Nietzsche and Shu, they don't think this way. If you go to uh, Hopen, uh, uh, Kimpon Hoke Shu, these are all Nietzsche and schools, I, two that are bigger than I can think of. Uh, there's Fuji Fuse, there's all kinds of Nietzsche and schools, all right? Mm -hmm. Only two schools view this this way. Us, okay, the Buddhism of the sun, you know, Soka Gakkai and Nietzsche and Shoshu. But Nietzsche and Shoshu still views it with the perspective of the priesthood being kind of in a separate space. Very class. All right? All right. Nam Yoho Rengeko, which is the manifest as the person law, he is regarded by his disciple and designated successor, Nico, and his followers as the Buddha of the latter day of the law. Nietzsche and himself writes in the opening of the eyes on the 12th day of the ninth month of last year between the hours of the rat and the ox, <clears throat> this person named Nietzsche was beheaded. It is his soul that has come to this island of Sado and in the second month of the following year, Snowbound is writing this to send to his close disciples. He states that he was beheaded, though actually he survived the execution at Tassanakuchi, implying that the ordinary person Nietzsche ceased to exist. In this context, this, the passage, it is his soul that has come to this island his place of exile means, means it doesn't mean he's not talking about soul or a permanent identity like that. He said it means that Nietzsche described himself as having a, revealed a deeper true identity in the course of his attempted execution. Not that he's always been the same entity all along. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. And again, Nico and his followers equate that identity with the Buddha of the latter day of the law. Nico and his followers, because there again, that's the priesthood the Buddha of, of the latter day of the law. But we can't be that Buddha of the latter day of the law, even though he says we are completely equal to him. All right. Second, third, the oneness of the person in the law. This means that the object of devotion in terms of the person and the object of devotion in terms of the law are one in their essence. The law is inseparable from the person and vice versa. The object of devotion in terms of the law is the physical embodiment as a mandala, the gohonzon, of the eternal intrinsic law and intrinsic law of Nam Yoho Rengekyo. Nichiren writes in his reply to Kyo, I, Nichiren, have inscribed my life in Sumi Inc., so believe in the gohonzon with your whole heart. This passage indicates that Nietzsche embodied in the Gohonzon the state of life he enjoyed as the eternal Buddha who personified the law, who personified the law, mm -hmm. because he, he did personify it. Yeah. So, that, so that people could attain the same state of enlightenment. enlightenment. The record of the orally transmitted teachings reads, the body that is freely uh, received and used, also the body of limitless joy, is none other than the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. That means it applies to us as much as it applied to him. The great teacher Dingyo says, a single moment of life comprising the 3,000 realms is itself the body that is freely received and used. This Buddha has forsaken august appearances. The Buddha who has forsaken august appearances is the Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies. Now, Nichiren and his followers who chant Nam Yoho Rengeko are just this. So what did I just describe? You. That's what I just described according to Nichiren Daishonin. 
All right. So there is no separation between you and Nietzsche. And that's why there's no separation between your life and the Gohonzon. Mm. OK, that's the reason why you can attain the same state as Nietzsche, because there's no difference. You're not an inferior entity. Uh, Nam Myoho Rengekyo are just this. The Buddha who has forsaken august appearances means a Buddha who is no different from an ordinary person in form and appearance. Mm -hmm. All right. The core of the three great secret laws for the Gohonzon or the object of devotion of the essential teaching is the core of the three great secret laws in Nietzsche's doctrine and represents the purpose of his life. The three great secret laws are the object of devotion of the essential teaching, the Gohonzon, the invocation, Nam Yoho Rengeke, or the Daimoku of the essential teaching, and the sanctuary of the essential teaching, which is wherever the Gohonzon is open. All right? Here, essential teaching refers to the teaching of Nam Yoho Rengeke, not the essential teaching latter half of the Lotus Sutra. Nichiren expressed the law of Nam Yoho Rengeke, he realized within his own life in these three forms, which corresponds to the three types of learning in Buddhism, precepts, meditation, and wisdom, and that's why we don't have to do all that. It's all included. The object of devotion co corresponds to meditation, the object of uh, the invocation to wisdom, and the sanctuary to precepts. Sanctuary is a translation of the word kaidan, which is also translated as ordination platform. This is the platform where practitioners vow to uphold the Buddhist precepts. Kosen Rufu, faith to the last moment of your life. Those are our vows. In Nietzsche's teaching, to embrace the object of devotion is the only precept. And the place where one enshrines the object of devotion and chants daimoku, the daimoku is called sanctuary. Again, to keep faith in the object of devotion and chant the daimoku while teaching others to chant it is called the invocation. Both the sanctuary and the invocation derive from the object of devotion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Hence, the object of devotion is the core of all three. Mm -hmm. For this reason, the Gohonzon, or the object of devotion, is also referred to as the one great secret law. That, that came from um, the 26th high priest, Nichikan. The inscriptions, five, fifth, the inscriptions on the Gohonzon, in fact, much of what I'm saying came from Nichikan, if not all of it. <laughs> The inscriptions on the Gohonzon in the center of the Gohonzon are written the Chinese characters Nam Yoho Renge Kyo Nichiren. This indicates the oneness of the person in law. On either side are characters for the names of beings representing each of the ten worlds. At the top of the Gohonzon, the names of Shakyamuni Buddha and Many Treasures Buddha appear respectively in the media left and right when facing the Gohonzon. Of these central characters, they represent the realm of or world of Buddhahood. The four bodhisattvas, superior practices, boundless practices, pure practices, and firmly established practices, which lead the other bodhisattvas of the earth, are positioned to the left and right of the two Buddhas on the front top row. You guys all know this, right? They, along with other bodhisattvas in the second row, form uh, from the top, such as Universal Worthy and Majishrai, represent the realm of bodhisattvas. Also, the second row uh, are persons of the two vehicles, voice hearers and cause awakened ones, such as Shayuri, future and Maheke Shayapa, and flanking them are respective representatives of the realms of heavenly beings such as Brahme, Chakra, the devil king of the sixth heaven, the gods of the sun and the moon. In the third row appear a wheel-turning king representing the realm of human beings, an Asura king representing the realm of Asuras, the dragon king representing the realm of animals, the mother of the, de uh, the demon children and the ten de demon daughters representing the realm of hungry spirits, and Devadatta representing the realm of hell. Moreover, the four heavenly kings are positioned in the four corners of the Gohonzon. Again, when facing the Gohonzon, Vashravana in the upper left, upholder of the, nature, of, of the nation in the upper right, wide-eyed in the lower right, and increase in growth in the lower left. While all other figures on the Gohonzon are, are represented in uh, Chinese characters, the names of the uh, wisdom king Craving Filled in the middle on the left side and Wisdom King Immovable are written in Vashravana and Upholder of the Nation respectively in Siddham, a medieval uh, uh, Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit script. Here the Wisdom King Craving Filled represents the principle of earthly desires are enlightenment and the Wisdom King Immovable represents the principle of the sufferings of birth and death or Nirvana. Other characters on the Golhansa include the names of the great Bodhisattva Hachiman and the Sun Goddess, all these names express the principles of the ten that the pr principles that exist within the eternal Buddha's life, and that living beings in the ten worlds can attain Buddhahood. 
Not all of the above names appear in, on every Gohonzon that is transcribed from the Dai Gohonzon. Again, those, that, what I just described is not represented on the Gohonzon we chant to now in its entirety. But whatever does do appear all the, all, represents all the ten worlds. The names of the great teacher Tentai and the great teacher Dingyo were inscribed in the lower part of the Gohonzon, representing those who transmitted the true lineage of Buddhism. These are two inscriptions gleaned from Yellow's annotations on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, which Nichiren used to describe the power of the Gohonzon and the law it, just, it embodies. One placed in the uh, uh, upper right facing the Gohonzon reads, those who vex and trouble, you guys know where that is, those who vex or trouble the uh, practitioners of the law will have their heads split into seven pieces. The other on the upper left reads, those who give alms to them will enjoy good fortune surpassing the ten honorable titles. The ten honorable titles are epithets applied to the Buddha expressing his virtue, wisdom, and compassion. In the lower right is Nichiren's declaration that this is the great mandala never be, uh, before known in the entire land of Jampadvipa in the more than 2,230 years since the Buddha's passing. And I believe if you go Google this, you can find a diagram on the Gohonzon to show you where all that's, what, where all that's said. So that's the Gohonzon. But what is the Gohonzon really? It's a manifestation of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Okay, so now let's go to Nam Myoho Renge Kyo 424. And I know you guys are getting burned out, but I'm doing this for everybody that doesn't know as much as you. 424, pardon me. Do you guys mind? No. no. All right. Are you getting anything out of this? I know it's a repeat of a lot of information that you may already know, but I hope that you uh, don't mind that refresher. All right. Nam Myoho Renge Kyo on page 424. The ultimate law or truth of the universe according to Nichiren's teachings. Nichiren first taught the invocation of Nam Myoho Renge Gekyo to a small group of people at Seichoji Temple in his native province of Awa, Japan on the 28th day of the fourth month in 1253. It literally means devotion to Myoho Renge Kyo. Myoho Renge Kyo is the Japanese reading of the Chinese title of the Lotus Sutra, which Nichiren regards as the sutra's essence and appending nam a phonetic chain of namu or to, or to that phrase indicates devotion to the title and essence of the sutra Nichiren identifies it with the universal law or precept implicit in the meaning of the sutra's text the meaning of nam myoho renge kyo is explained in the opening section of the record of the orally transmitted teachings which i've also already read the record of, of Nichiren's lectures on the lotus sutra compiled by his disciple and uh, successor Nikko. It states that Namu derives from the Sanskrit word namas and is translated as devotion or dedicating one's life. What one should devote, dedicate one's life to, he says, are the person and the law. Now, it's very important that you perceive these words for what they're saying. Because he just used the word that he basically saying that derives, it's, okay, is translated as devotion or dedicating one's life. So when we chant Daimoku to the Gohonzon, we are not only dedicating our lives, but we're also making the vow to dedicate our life. Do you understand? It's synonymous at the same moment, mm. right? What one should dedicate one's life to, he says, are the person and the law, the Go, what, what's represented in the Gohonzon. The person signifies Shakyamuni, which means eternal Buddha, and the law is the Lotus Sutra, which means the ultimate truth of Myoho Rengekyo. According to the orally transmitted teachings, the act of devotion, namu, has two aspects. One is to devote oneself to or fuse one's life with the eternal and unchanging truth, nam myoho renge kyo. The other is that through this fusion of one's life with the ultimate truth, one simultaneously draws forth inexhaustible wisdom that functions in accordance with changing circumstances. So what did that just say? What's the process going on here? I'll read it again real quick. According to the orally transmitted teachings, the act of devotion, Namu, has two aspects. One is devote oneself to or fuse one's life with the eternal and unchanging truth. The other is that through this fusion of one's life with the ultimate truth, one simultaneously draws forth inexhaustible wisdom that functions in accordance with changing circumstances. What is it talking about? Uh, inexhaustible wisdom that functions in accordance with changing circumstances. This phrase, in accordance with changing circumstances, is used often. He's talking about, by chanting Daimoku with faith, 
in the teaching and the object of devotion and embracing it on the basis that has been described to us that we are, okay? We're not looking at it as Nietzsche and Daishonin outside of us, a great powerful person that we could, we, we beg him, please answer my prayer. No, from that wisdom, we understand that we're, we got the power. Yes. Okay, and so we chant Daimoku about things going on in the nine realms that we live in right now in this moment. So that's the functions in accordance with changing circumstances. Changing circumstances is one moment to the next moment to the next moment to the next moment. That's never static. The law itself is. It's unchanging. Do you understand? But everything that reflects the law is ever changing. Okay. All right. So the orally transmitted teachings, top of page um, 425, states that one may also note that the nam of nam myoho rengekyo is a Sanskrit word, while myoho rengekyo are Chinese words. Sanskrit and Chinese join in a single moment to form nam myoho rengekyo. If we express the title of the Lotus Sutra in Sanskrit, it will be Sadharma Pundaraika Sutra. This is myoho rengekyo. Sat is a phonetic change of sat, meaning myo or wonderful. Dharma means ho, law or phenomena. Pundurayka means renge or lotus blossom. Uh, pardon me. Uh, sutra means kyo or sutra. The nine uh, Chinese characters represent the Sanskrit that represent the Sanskrit title are the nine, uh, Buddha bodies of the nine honored ones. This expresses the idea that the nine worlds are none other than the Buddha world. Myo stands for the Dharma nature or enlightenment, while Ho represents darkness or ignorance. Together as Myoho, they express the idea that ignorance and the Dharma nature are a single entity or one in essence. Ignorance and, okay, let me say it again. Together as Myoho, they, they, they express the idea that ignorance and the Dharma nature are a single entity or one in essence. Why is that significant? Why is it significant that they, that they be uh, one in essence? Ignorance, don't know shit. And the Dharma nature, know everything. Mm. One in essence, why is, the, why is it that? Why, what's the, why is that concept so significant? It's the truth and we validate it as the truth. Mm. How do we validate it as the truth? Because we have both of them. We have By going from the nine worlds to revealing the 10th, yes, okay? Okay, <clears throat> Renge stands for the two elements. That's, that's why we can attain Buddhahood in our present form as common mortals. Yes. That's why we are Buddhas even though we're common mortals. Yes. Renge stands for the two elements of cause and effect. Cause and effect are also a single entity because there's simultaneity. They're, they, they're both self-contained within one another. Yes. Kyo represents the words and voices of all living beings. The commentary says the voice carries out the work of the Buddha, and it is called Kyo. Kyo may be defined as that which is constant and unchanging in the three existences of, of past, present, and future. The Dharma realm is Myoho, the wonderful law. The Dharma realm is Renge, the lotus blossom. The Dharma realm is Kyo, the sutra. As Nichiren states, Namu derives from Sanskrit, and Myoho Rengekyo come from Chinese. Nam myoho rengekyo is therefore not simply a Japanese phrase, but a Japanese reading of a Sanskrit and Chinese phrase. In this sense, it contains aspects of the languages of three countries in which Mahayana Buddhism spread. According to Nietzsche's treatise, the entity of the mystic law, Nanye and Tintai of China and Dingyo of Japan recited the invocation, meaning devotion to the Lotus Sutra of the Wonderful Law, or Nam myoho rengekyo, as their private practice. Of course, they didn't do it with, in Japanese. They, they, they did it in, 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 in Chinese. Uh, they, they would have done the Pundarika, whatever, devotion to Sadharma, Pundarika, whatever I just said a minute ago. <laughs> I was reading how to say it in Sanskrit. Uh, as a private practice, but they did not spread this practice to others. In On the Great Secret, uh, three, last paragraph of page 425, on the three great seek in on the great three great secret laws, Nietzsche states that the Daimoku Nietzsche chants today in the latter day of the law, Namyoho Rengekyo, is different from that of previous ages. Tentai and the, the Daimoku that Tentai and others chanted in the former and the middle of the day of the law. They wouldn't have chanted Namyoho Rengekyo because they're not Japanese, right? It's not the latter day of the law. Right. It's a different age. Right. All right. Uh, because the practice of the Daimoku of the latter day of the law uh, involves chanting. Okay, 
he says, okay, this is what he is saying is the biggest difference. Because what did these guys use the invocation of the Daimoku for their time for? What did, when he's just talking about Tentai and Myolo and Nanye, where did they write about that law? Eternal. They never revealed it. Oh, yeah. They yeah. referred to it only as the yeah. law. They never yeah. revealed it. It was for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It was for their own Buddhahood because they knew nobody else could handle this shit. Mm -hmm. Okay? They, I don't have time to teach you what it's taken my whole life to learn. Okay? That's the difference mm -hmm. between, because now we got to do Shakabuka because it's time for Kosum Rufu. That was never mentioned in any of this right, that I've right, talked right, about right. so far, has it been? Right, no. it's been? Widespread propagation, not of the Lotus Sutras, widespread propagation of Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. It can't happen until the fifth 500 year period and after. Mm -hmm. All right? It can't happen until the advent of the, of the original teacher. And on the three great secret laws, Nietzsche instead states that the Daimoku Nietzsche chants today in the latter day of the law is different from that of the previous ages. The Daimoku of Tintai and others chanted in the former and the middle day of the law. Because the practice of Daimoku in the latter day of the law involves chanting it for oneself and teaching others to do so as well. Nietzsche not only established the invocation Daimoku of Nam Yohor and Geiko, but, all, but embodied it as a mandala, making, it the, making the object of devotion called Gohonzon. Making it the object of devotion called Gohonzon. In his letter to Kyoho, reply to Kyoho, he states, I, Nietzsche, have inscribed my life in Sumi Inc., so believe in the Gohonzon with your whole heart. The Buddha's will is, not, is the Lotus Sutra, but the soul of Nietzsche is nothing other than Nam Yohor and Geiko. And again, soul is... That's a translative word. Uh, <clears throat> okay. True aspect of the truth. Where am I here? That was Nami Ahur and Geiko. Yep. Pardon me. 3,000 realms. Okay, now we're going to get to Ichin and Sanzen uh, real quick. Page 729. I'm just going through this by page number, not necessarily um, 3,000. Hang on. 729. Yeah. Sorry. That's what's, thank you. 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, which is how we attain Buddhahood in our present form. Everybody understands that, right? Right. Okay. Why is that how we attain Buddhahood in our present form? Because that's the manner in which we can reveal the 10th world. Okay? Because we live in the nine. 3,000 realms requires that the 10th be acknowledged as being an existing reality. Yeah. Okay? Page 729, 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, uh, each and sunset. Also the principle of a single moment of life comprising 3,000 realms. This is very important. A single moment of life, each and in, is also translated as one mind, mm. yeah. one thought, or one thought moment. Mm. A philosophical system established by Tintai in his great concentration and insight, Maka Shikan, on the basis of the phrase, the true aspect of all phenomena from the expedient means chapter of the Lotus Sutra. The 3,000 realms or the entire phenomenal world exist in a single moment of life. I'll say it again, even though it's hard to understand or comprehend. The 3,000 realms or the entire phenomenal world exist in a single moment of life. The number 3,000 here comes from the following calculation. 10 worlds times 10 worlds times 10 factors times 3 realms of existence. Life at any moment manifests one of the 10 worlds. Each of these worlds possess the potential for all 10 within itself. This is the mutual possession or mutual inclusion of the 10 worlds to rep represent, is represented as 10 squared or 100 possible worlds. Each of these hundred worlds possesses the 10 factors, making 1,000 factors or potentials. And these operate within each of the three realms of existence, thus making 3,000 realms. The, theoret the theoretical first half of the Lotus Sutra expounds the 10 factors of life. It also sets forth the attainment of Buddhahood by persons of the two vehicles, voice hearers and cause awakened ones, which signif signifies the mutual possession of the 10 worlds. Don't forget voice hears and cause awakened ones until the Lotus Sutra couldn't attain Buddhahood. You're with me on that, right? Okay. So <clears throat> the essential teaching latter half of the Sutra reveals the true cause, the eternal nine worlds, and true effect, the eternal Buddhahood, eternal Buddhahood. 
and the true land, the eternal land or realm of the environment. Ten type. By the way, when he says eternal each time, he's talking about eternal. Okay, so the eternal nine worlds. That means that these nine worlds that we live in are eternal. They always exist. They've always existed. When you incarnate as a living being, a living being always has these nine worlds. And it has always had these nine worlds. And it's had the same process for, for, for moving forward karmically. Uh, the essential teaching, last, uh, latter half, reveals the true cause, eternal nine worlds, the true effect, eternal Buddhahood, and the true land, the eternal land or realm of the environment. Tantai identified all these concepts in one system, 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Volume 5 of Great Concentration and Insight reads, Life at each moment is endowed with the ten worlds. At the same time, each, word, each of the ten worlds is endowed with all ten worlds. So it is, an, it is so that an entity of life actually possesses 100 worlds. Each of the worlds in turn possesses 30 realms, which means that in 100 worlds there are 3,000 realms. The 3,000 realms of existence are all possessed by a single moment of life by a single moment of life. So any single moment of life, it doesn't matter, it's you, me, the birds, the bushes, okay? Any single moment of life encompasses all 3,000 realms. If there is no life, then that's the end of the matter. But if there's the slightest bit of life, it contains all 3,000 realms, potentialities as well. This is what we mean when we speak of the region of the infallible, because you couldn't wrap your head about what, that, around what that really is if you tried for 40, 50, 60 years, 50 anyhow. Uh, <clears throat> the 3,000 realms are all, okay, pardon me. Uh, life at each moment at the very bottom of page 729. Life at each moment means life as an indivisible whole that includes body and mind, cause and effect, and, and sentient and insentient things. This is what I've been referring to several times. Mm -hmm. Say it again. Life at each moment means life as an indivisible whole, an indivisible whole. That includes, because it's each moment, whatever is in, has a state of life at that moment throughout the universe is what we're talking about in the life in that moment, right? Mm. <clears throat> uh, life in each means the invisible whole that includes body and mind, mm. cause and effect, mm. sentient and insentient. Mm -hmm. A single moment of life is endowed as stated above with 3,000 realms. The relationship of the two of these two elements is not such that one precedes the other or that they are simultaneous as in, in the sense that one is included in the other. Actually, they are non-dual or as Tentai put it, two in phenomena, but not two in essence because they all share the original state. The, the provisional teaching stated that all phenomena arise from the mind and they are subordinate to the mind, right? All of the Buddhism of the harvest stuff. Mm. Pardon me. The Lotus Sutra clarifies that the true aspect is inseparable from all phenomena and that all phenomena, just as they are, are themselves the true aspect because they're all in essence the original building block of all of them everything is nam myoho rengekyo when tantai stated the 3000 realms of existence are all possessed by life in a single moment but if there is the slight but if there is the slightest bit of life it contains all 3000 realms he is referring to the non duality of a single moment of life and the 3000 realms the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life is, cla is classified into two as the theoretical principle and the actual embodiment of this principle. Prior to Nietzsche, you could only do theoretical. What? No. Okay, pardon me. Uh, there, pardon me. The 3,000 realms in a single moment of life is classified it into two as the theoretical principle and the actual embodiment of this principle. These are respectively termed the theoretical 3,000 realms in a single moment of life and the actual 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. And that's why he goes, we, what, what Tentai and those guys did was, was theoretical, but what I do is actual. Okay, so actual Ichin and Sons and only comes with the Gohonzon and Nam Myoho Rengekyo. Mm -hmm. Actual, uh, it's because it's theoretical until yeah. the component that makes it all work mm -hmm. is made available by the original teacher in the fifth 500 year period and you couldn't do it any time prior to that. Right. OK, mm -hmm. so it wasn't like they were screwed up and they didn't have what it took. They were in the wrong age and they didn't have the karma. 
They weren't bodhisattvas of the earth. Right. That's the point. Right. All right? The three... Pardon me. Yeah. The 3,000 realms is classified because they are termed... The theoretical 3,000... Okay, okay. There. The theoretical principle is based on the theory, theoretical teaching of the Lotus Sutra, which expounds the equality of Buddhahood in the nine worlds. Both it points out are manifestations of the true aspect. The theoretical teaching also reveals the mutual possession of the ten worlds based on the principle of that persons of the two vehicles who were denied Buddhahood in the provisional teachings also possess innate Buddhahood and can attain it because it's revealed in the Lotus Sutra. Strictly speaking, however, the theoretical teaching reveals only the hundred worlds and multiplying it by the ten factors of life, one thousand factors, and does not reveal their eternal nature. Only supported by only when supported by the essential teaching, the latter half of the Lotus Sutra, where he's saying it's not been I wasn't under the Bodhi tree. It's been numberless major world system, dust particle kalpas. It's only when he reveals numberless major each uh, sons and uh, sons Goyaku Jintingo that that's first expounded. Only when supported by the essential teaching, latter half of the Lotus Sutra, can the theoretical teaching be said to expound theoretically as a possibility the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Theoretically, you can attain Buddhahood as a common mortal. That's why those guys didn't pr pr try and teach everybody about it. Mm. There's nobody that believed them. You're going completely against what Shakyamuni said all this time, what you've been saying all this time. What the hell's going on? And that's what Nietzsche had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the truth was something that hadn't, it was buried, right? On the other hand, the essential teaching reveals Shakyamuni's enlightenment in the remote past, the true effect, eternal Buddhahood. The eternal life of his disciples, the Bodhisattvas of the earth, the true cause, and the eternal nine worlds, and the uh, eternity of the Sahe world, the true land. These explain the eternal <coughs> ten worlds and eternal three realms of existence, and thus the actual 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Just, so it's not just a theoretical concept. Do you understand? Mm. It's a real thing. Mm. Despite its comprehensive view, the essential teaching does not go on to reveal the practice that enables one to embody. And when he says the essential teaching here, he's talking about the last 14 chapters of the Lotus Sutra. Mm. The essential teaching does not go on to reveal the practice that enables one to embody directly this principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. Though the sutra says if there are those who hear the law, then not one will fail to attain Buddhahood. It does not identify what law, what the law is. That is why Nichiren I, uh, defined the entire Lotus Sutra, both the theoretical and essential teachings, the full 28 chapters as representing the theoretical 3,000 realms in a single moment of life because it doesn't have nam myoho Rengeko anywhere in it. And it doesn't have the Gohonzon anywhere in it. And you can't achieve actual each and sons without those two things. So he's saying even the Lotus Sutra in the absence of my teaching and the absence of the age, it's theoretical. All right? In contrast, Nietzsche embodied his life embracing the 3,000 realms in a single moment of life or the life of nam myoho Rengeko in the mandala known as the Gohonzon and established the practice for attaining Buddhahood. That practice is to chant nam myoho Rengeko with faith in the Gohonzon. In Nietzsche's teaching, this is the practice for observing the mind, observing one's own mind and seeing Buddhahood in it, perceiving yourself as the Buddha, Okay. In Nietzsche's teaching, this is the practice for observing the mind, observing one's own mind and seeing Buddhahood in it. For this reason, it's not chanting for benefits, ultimately. Okay? For this reason, his teaching is summarized in the phrase, embracing the Gohonzon is itself observing the mind, or embracing the Gohonzon is itself att uh, attaining Buddhahood. Because in doing so, you will attain Buddhahood. He states in a 1273 uh, letter known as Reply to Kyo, I, Nietzsche, and have inscribed my life in Sumi Inc. So believe in the Gohonzon with your whole heart. The Buddha's will is Lotus Sutra, but the soul of Nietzsche is nothing other than Nam Myoho And in his 1273 treatise, Object of Devotion, Preserving the Mind, showing profound compassion for those unable to comprehend the gem of the doctrine of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life, the Buddha wrapped it within the five characters of Myoho Rengeko with which he then adorned the necks of the ignorant people of the latter day. 
Nietzsche Khan, who's the 26th high priest I was referring to earlier, uh, the 26th high priest of Nietzsche, uh, Taisekaji Temple interpreted the above passage of volume five of great concentration and insight from the viewpoint of Nietzsche's teaching. Nietzsche Khan defined life at each moment as the life of the eternal Buddha or nam myoho which is inscribed down the center of the Gohonzon. He further interpreted endowed with the 10 worlds as the Buddha's Bodhisattvas and other figures, in, uh, figures inscribed on both sides of nam myoho in the uh, in the Gohonzon. These represent the principles of the mutual possession of the 10 worlds, the 100 worlds and the 1,000 factors, and the 3,000 realms. According to Nietzsche Khan, the sentence 3,000 realms of existence are all possessed by life in a single moment refers to the region of, um, of the unfathomable, unfathomable, which he interprets as the object of devotion that embodies the principle of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. This is not to be viewed simply as an external object, but as something that exists in the life of a person with faith in the object of devotion. Very important two sentences there. Let me go back to the last paragraph. On page 731 under this 3,000 realms. Uh, according to Nietzsche Khan, the sentence 3,000 realms of existence are all possessed by life in a single moment refers to the region of the unfathomable. Now, why is it the region of the unfathomable, unfathomable, which he interprets as the object of devotion, the Gohonzon, that embodies the 3,000 realms, okay? But he says, the 3,000 realms of existence are all possessed by life in a single moment, refers to the region of the unfathomable. unfathomable. Because the Gohonzon is the region of the unfathomable, and all things have Nam Yoho Rengeko, the Gohonzon as an intrinsic part of it, okay? Uh, this is not to be viewed simply as an external object, which many people do view it as. That's why they keep the boots on very clean. They think that all that kind of stuff is going to attain. No, 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 is how you should behave. But that's not how you get there. Understanding the truth is how you get there. All right. This is not to be viewed simply as an external object, but as something that exists in the life of a person of with faith in the object of devotion, with faith in the. So this is a bodhisattva of the earth. This would be a disciple of the original teacher. Then, okay, without faith, the object of devotion endowed with the three thousand realms does, does not exist in one's life. Without faith, the object of devotion. Uh, Endowed with the 3,000 realms does not exist within one's life. How can that be? It's the original state. But you can't manifest it without faith. You cannot make it a reality. You cannot bring it forth into the nine realms. You can't be the Buddha unless you're a person of faith. Uh, Without faith, the object of devotion, okay. Thus, Nietzsche Khan stated is the ultimate teaching of Tentai's doctrine, okay? And that was, uh, now, now I'm going to get the, hang on, the true aspect of all phenomena is page 761, and then I got one more, and then I'm done. And I made the note about particle physics because, it's, again, this is already proven by science. It wasn't when I started practicing in 1973. Uh, Science had not progressed to the point that there was a premise and a basis for perceiving cause and effect as being uh, simultaneous. Now there is. Yeah, it is now. It's uh, okay. So pardon me, seven sixty one, yeah. and then I'm almost done, guys. Seven sixty one. The true aspect of all phenomena. Do you guys see how this is all coming? This is all bleeding off of one another. This is all continuous thought. Everything I've read is related to the, what the, to the thing before it, okay? The true aspect of all phenomena, the ultimate truth or reality that permeates all phenomena and is no way separate from them. A principle expressed in the expedient means chapter of Lotus Sutra. The chapter states, the true aspect of all phenomena can only be understood and shared between Buddhas. Why? Because if you can understand it, then you are a Buddha, okay? And you couldn't share it if you didn't understand it. 
So that is a self-explanatory sentence. The true aspect of all phenomena can only be understood and shared between Buddhists. This reality consists of the appearance, nature, and the ten factors are then. The appearance, nature, entity, power, influence, internal cause, relation, latent effect, manifest effect, and their consistency from beginning to end. Nyoze so, nyoze so, nyoze tai. Right? All the way through. To, no, uh, okay. The expedient means chapter defines the true aspect of all phenomena as the ten factors of life from appearance through their consistency from beginning to end, which describe the unchanging aspect of life common to all phenomena. All phenomena. Since the ten factors exist in any being of the ten worlds, there can, there can be no fundamental distinction between a Buddha and an ordinary person. That's why we can become the Buddha. It's a part of our life already. This revelation... Of the ten factors of life establishes a theoretical basis for the universal attainment of Buddhahood. Based on this passage the, uh, of the expedient means chapter Tentai established a philosophical system of 3,000 realms in a single moment of life. In his 1273 work entitled The True Aspect of All Phenomena, Nietzsche defined all phenomena as all living beings and their environments. So that would be all living yeah. beings. So all people, all animals, all insentient plants, everything and their environments, the dirt, the sun, the whatever, uh, in the 10 worlds and the true aspect as the law of Milho Rengekyo. Pardon me, Nietzsche defined all phenomena in all, as all living beings and their environment in the 10 worlds and the true aspect as the law of Milho Rengekyo because that's the basis of everything that I just discussed that was, that was just mentioned previously, the ultimate reality permeating all living beings in their environments in any of the ten worlds. All phenomena, he stated, are manifestations of this universal law. Phenomena and ultimate truth are inseparable and non-dual. Can't be separated. And then, uh, true Buddha. And then we're done. 762, next thing, okay. True Buddha. A Buddha in his true identity in contrast to his transient or provisional identity. This term applied in, is applied in two specific ways. One, to Shakyamuni Buddha as he describes himself in the lifespan chapter of the Lotus Sutra, that is, having attained Buddhahood in the remote past countless kalpas ago. In that chapter, Shakyamuni states, in all the worlds, the heavenly and human beings and the Asuras all believe that the present Shakyamuni Buddha, after leaving the palace of the Shakyas, seated himself in the place of meditation not far from the city of Gaya, uh, Gaye, and there attained supreme perfect enlightenment. But good men, it has been immeasurable, boundless, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions of nayudas of kalpas, since I, in fact, attained Buddhahood. With this statement, Shakyamuni redefines his identity as a Buddha who originally attained his enlightenment in the remarkably remote past. From the standpoint of the philosophy of the Lotus Sutra, the Shakyamuni who is, taught to, who is thought to have attained enlightenment in the current life under the Bodhi tree in India is a provisional Buddha, or a Buddha in his transient identity. In his provisional identity, Shakyamuni is seen as a temporary manifestation of the true Buddha who employed various temporary expedient teachings to prepare people to understand his true identity identity and true teachings and thereby lead them to enlightenment. From the perspective of the content of the Lotus Sutra, the true Buddha corresponds to the, to the Shakyamuni, not to Shakyamuni, to the Shakyamuni depicted in the essential teaching latter half of the Lotus Sutra, because that's why I went through all that with you to talk about the Lotus Sutra and how did we get it and the process of nobody, it wasn't, it didn't go straight from those people that heard Shakyamuni and were written down, okay? For 200 years, it was passed on as, a, as, a, as an oral teaching, yeah. all right? The true Buddha corresponds to the Shakyamuni depicted in the essential teaching last latter half of the Lotus Sutra, while the Buddha in his transient identity is the Shakyamuni of the theoretical teaching first half of the sutra. Second, as a reference to Nietzsche and applied to him traditionally by those in the lineage of his disciple Nikko and Ikko, in the profound meaning of Lotus Sutra, Tantai refers to the true cause and the true effect as the first two stages of the as it, as the first two of the ten mystic principles of the essential teaching of Lotus Sutra based on the revelation of Shakyamuni's original attainment of enlightenment in the remote past. His, he associates the true cause with the, with the sentence in the lifespan chapter, originally I practiced the Bodhisattva way and the life that I acquired then is yet to come to an end. The true effect with the sentence since I attained Buddhahood an extremely long period of time has passed. 
In the remote past, Shakyamuni practiced the Bodhisattva way, the true cause, and attained Buddhahood, true effect. Shakyamuni never specifically reveals, however, what teaching he originally practiced, the original cause or seed of his Buddhahood. Regarding this, Nietzsche states the doctrine of the sowing of the seed and its maturing and harvesting is the very heart and core of the Lotus Sutra. All the Buddhas of the three existences and ten directions have invariably attained Buddhahood through the seeds represented by the five characters of Myoho Rengekyo. From this perspective, Nietzsche is regarded as the teacher of true cause and Shakyamuni as the teacher of true effect. This is because the Lotus, in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni revealed his eternal Buddhahood, the effect of his original Bodhisattva practice. He did not, however, reveal the true cause or the nature of the specific practice by which he attained it. Nietzsche, on the other hand, revealing the teaching and practice of nam myoho which he identified as the true cause that enables all people to attain Buddhahood. This viewpoint identifies Nietzsche as the true Buddha. Nietzsche explains the passage of the Lotus Sutra cited above. It has been immeasurable, boundless, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, millions of Nayudas of Kalpa since I, in fact, attained Buddhahood. In the record of the orally transmitted teachings, he says, I, in fact, is explaining that Shakyamuni, in fact, attained Buddhahood in the inconceivably remote past. The meaning of this chapter, however, is that I represents the living beings of the phenomenal world. I here refers to each and every being of the ten worlds. In fact, establishes that I is a Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies. This is what is being called a fact. Attained refers both to what both to the one who attains and what is attained. Attain means to open or reveal. It is to reveal that the beings of the phenomenal world are Buddhas eternally endowed with the three bodies. Buddhahood means being enlightened to this. Here, Nietzsche is saying that every single being is essentially a Buddha eternally endowed with the three bodies, a true Buddha. In this sense, true Buddha refers to the Pardon me, refers to the Buddha nature eternally inherent in the living in the lives of all living beings. In the true aspect of all phenomena, Nietzsche writes, a common mortal is an entity of the three bodies and a true Buddha. A Buddha is a function of the three bodies and a provisional Buddha. See also Buddha's beginningless time, Buddha, and that's again, that's what it really is versus how it had been viewed up to the point in time of his teaching. Uh, and I could go into true cause, but I'm not going to, because how long have we already been one hour and 37. One hour? 37. We got to end here then. All right, so then next week, we'll actually start with, remember all of this background information. We'll start with okay. reading the Go Show. I uh, know, not next week. No. Next or pardon time. me, next week. Next, next time, time, I should say. <laughs> Okay. okay, and then and and within those two, like you know, we always go the last weekend of the month, and then the first weekend of the yes. month, so that they're that like last week we were just together right. a week ago. Yeah. So I'm going to do this whole first go show in that yeah. two yeah. session, yeah. and it's 16 pages, whatever. So, right. thank you. Thank, thank you. you.